This entitled parent has decided to keep everyone awake all night. And unfortunately for her victims, there is no escape as they are all stuck on an airplane together. Happy birthday, today's your birthday and on with the revamped show. My last two jobs have been at financial institutions, and I've enjoyed them both, being the kind of service that everyone needs. We see all kinds, so naturally there are some trouble customers. The other day I was visiting the bank I used to work at before moving to the credit union I currently call work. For those confused by the difference between a bank and a credit union, all credit unions are banks, not all banks are credit unions. The banks don't like credit unions using bank lingo, though credit unions think that's fine since we like to differentiate ourselves anyway. Not all credit unions are connected, privacy laws, and at a credit union, you are not a customer, you are a member, and your common shares account means you own a part of the company. I was closing some investments, and while I was talking to the teller, I became the recipient of a very hard tap on the shoulder. I turned around to see this lady that I had helped when I used to work there. She had a very angry look on her face. Angry lady. There you are. I've been trying to reach you for months. Why haven't you returned my call? Oh, hi. I'm sorry. I moved over to another institution. Oh, you're here now. I need help with my mutual funds. Well, I can't help you with your investments here. I haven't worked here in almost two years. Don't give me that. If you don't work here, why are you here? I'm closing my accounts and taking them to where I work. Why? Are you losing money here too? No, nothing like that. It's just easier for me to... Well, you must have some good reason to move your millions in banker money, especially with the fees you idiots charge here. Full disclosure, the vast majority of my savings went towards a down payment on a house last year, and now I have debt. The remainder of what I withdrew the other day went to cover my overdraft. Well, I guess I don't need to worry about that anymore. What? Why? Because I don't work here anymore. Stop lying! You need to give me my money right now! I can't. You can, and you will, or I'll have you fired. You can't. Yes, I can. I know your manager. Well, I know you know him. I'm the one who introduced you to him when he he transferred from another branch and he's not my manager anymore since don't you dare say you don't me annoyed I don't work here anymore I turned back to the teller who had finished closing most of my accounts and consolidated them into one and was preparing a draft to take my credit union to deposit it there somehow there weren't any other customers in the branch and the teller and I just exchanged smiles and eye rolls again with the shoulder tap I turned around slowly ma'am if you touch me again. You'll what? Finger poked to my chest. You'll close my accounts. I've decided to leave here anyway. Oh, cool. Angry lady eyebrows now airborne. Well, I never. Yes. Yes, you did. Every day. She turned around with a huff and made a stompy hurry towards the door, but decided to make an impromptu visit to my old manager's office. I turned around to finish my business with the teller. 30 seconds later, this is what I heard. Enter the manager. You can't do that. I'll not be treated this way. I want that employee fired. Ma'am, I've heard everything that went on out there. He told you at least five times he doesn't work here anymore, which means you are abusing my customer. According to the policy which you signed when you opened your account with us and were told to read and not just discard, I have the right to deny you service. How dare you? That's enough, ma'am. I've already taken the liberty of closing your accounts, demarketing your profile, and charging the appropriate fees. What fees? Fees, fees and withholding taxes for withdrawing from an RRSP and early withdrawal fees for your GICs. I'll have a teller make a draft for you. The hell my mortgage get paid? I'm still working on the calculations for the early payout penalties. Clearly flabbergasted, the lady left the bank without another word. I could feel an icy cold death stare on the back of my neck as she glided toward the door. For some people in life, their best method for just getting through should be saying nothing. You don't necessarily need to have something intelligent to say all the time. You just have to not say something stupid. In the case of the angry lady, her pride got the best of her and she was the one who ended up as the biggest loser. I live in the Netherlands and am usually awake way past midnight and fall asleep in the morning. A lovely quiet evening of gaming. Nothing going on, just shooting the breeze and some pixelated baddies on a cooperative server. While I was awaiting a respawn, my phone rings. Hello? Caller with a female voice. Hello, I'd like to order a pizza. You've dialed the wrong number. No, I'm pretty sure I dialed XXX pizza. No ma'am, you dialed the wrong number. Their number ends with a one, mine ends with a two. You must have mispressed the last number. Listen 
listen here, young man. I'm 32 and wheeze slightly when I speak. I know that I dialed the right number and I want to order a pizza. Well, I know for a fact that you didn't. Me looking at the clock as I say that. And even if you did, that place closed over an hour ago. You need to stop lying. I know I called the right number, now take my order. Nope, I hang up on her. I'm not going to play the did not, did to game with some random idiot on the phone. Not even a minute later, my landline phone rings again. I don't recognize it as I hadn't looked the first time I answered it, but I see it's a cell phone calling me. Hello? Finally, someone answers the phone. I tried to call before and the young man that answered was really rude and hung up on me. Well, obviously I recognize the voice. That was me. And I told you, lady, I'm not the pizza place and you have the wrong number. When I speak, my voice comes back at me very slightly. Oh joy, I'm on speaker. But I want pizza. I kid you not, this lady starts clapping her hands at me. Guess I figured out why I'm on speaker now. Also, I know that the pizza place that she's trying to call is run by Turkish people, but they speak the local language just as well as people that have been living here all their lives. Clapping after each word doesn't improve another's ability to understand you one bit. If anything, it makes you look like a colossal moron. But hey, tit for tat. Me clutching my hand set between my jaw and shoulder. I am not the pizza place. And I promptly hang up again. This lady calls me a total of six times, counting the first two here. She called back like clockwork moments after I'd hung up, so I can only assume that she just hit redial on my number, not actually taking the time to properly look at the number she dialed. But I had snapped a quick picture of the number she was using to call me, using my cell phone, somewhere on the fourth or fifth time. It's literally 11.30 p.m. and I just want to be left alone and play my games. So I look up an old SMS bomb tool while my phone keeps ringing with her number on it. I find the tool, set it to spam, quit hitting redial and dial the actual number you want to reach. 100 times and set it off. It's now 3 in the morning as I finish writing this and needless to say, the calls have stopped after I set the SMS bomb on her. When it's late at night and you're just using time to chill out, play some video games, disconnect from the rest of the world, the last thing you want is one of the most annoying people to be constantly harassing you and calling your phone, demanding you make them pizza. After the second time, I would have just disconnected my phone. Nobody needs to answer the phone at that time anyway. Do you think people like this ever feel any remorse? Like if she actually checked the number and was like, oh crap, I actually did type it wrong. Man, I feel really bad that I bothered that guy really late at night. Something tells me they'd still blame them anyway. Should have told me I was calling the wrong number. So school has just let out for us and summer break is on its way. I'm traveling with my family to the States for some fun stateside jazz. So our flight is at the ungodly hour of 3 a.m. So most people just want to sleep. My family didn't pay to be sat together, so we were spread all throughout the economy class seats. I got lucky with my seat, having it be right at the window. I've gotten comfy with my small pillow and blanket and get ready for a nice sleep. I heard shuffling in the aisle and thinking nothing of it since people are still getting on the plane when someone taps my shoulder. Hey hun, you you're in my spot. I open my eyes and look up at the Karen and kid. Sorry ma'am, but my ticket says 10A. I am in the right spot. I'll help you find out where you need to go if you want. She scoffs at me but hands her ticket over. I mentally sigh. 10B and 10C. Well, you don't need to go far. This is your row. I said as I handed them their ticket back. Then why don't you move if this is our row? EM said as she tapped her foot. Ma'am, there are three seats. A, B and C. I I have seat A and you guys have seats B and C. Please sit down so the passengers can pass you. With a huff, she and her kid shuffled into the seat and shortly after we took off. The first one to four hours passes and since it's an 11 hour flight, there are movies and jazz. The EM is in the aisle and the kid is next to me. The kid taps on my shoulder and asks if I can open the window so she could look out. I told her I couldn't since I might wake up other people, but I would in an hour or so. She nodded and went back to her movie and so do I. Maybe five minutes go by when the EM reaches across both of us and flips the window sheet open. Very bright light in pitch plane. Great power move. I slam it shut while rubbing my eyes. Why? I ask as I adjust to the darkness again. My kid wants to look out the window and you wouldn't let her. She's a kid. Just give her what she wants. I spoke to your kid about it and we agreed I'd open it in an hour since some people are still sleeping. Her response? Well, I don't care about other people. My kid wanted something so I gave it to her. The kid looks like she wants to 
crawl under the seat. I ignore the EM for most of the flight until it comes to the lunch. She and her kid get their stuff and when I'm about to ask the flight attendant for lunch, the EM waves them along saying, my other child isn't hungry. I was confused but managed to get lunch when they're on their way back, giving the EM a really lady face while I ate. As promised, I opened the window for the kid and all was well. I pulled my laptop out and began to play some games. Undertales, Sims, Plants vs Zombies, all offline games. Hey, you aren't supposed to have that out. I actually can because it's in airplane mode, I respond. I continue playing until this fish slams my computer closed. I pull my hands out and take a deep inhale. Leave me the heck alone, I snap. Excuse me? Who do you think you are talking to me like that? I'm the kid that's not going to take crap from some adult that I don't know. How dare you curse in front of my child? Just leave me alone, I said as I ignored her 30 minute rant about me, her hands covering the kid's ears as she ranted. The rest of the flight had a heavy tension, but not much was said afterward. Hope that kid doesn't get spoiled and turn into an EK. And that truly is our greatest hope, that the next generation will be slightly less crap than the entitled generation before it. The EP encounters on a plane are the most terrifying because you're stuck there. And this one was really creepy, like pretending it was her kid so that she had power over them. That's just really weird. I am glad that they still got lunch because can you imagine having to deal with an entitled parent and being hungry on an 11 hour flight? Yeah, welcome to my worst nightmares. Where I live, we have to drive our recyclables to a central place where there are multiple containers for each type of material. These containers are huge, having the length and width of full ocean going shipping containers and about 7 feet tall. They have a single massive lid on top that is lifted partially open, about a foot for people to insert things over the sides. Not everyone can reach that high, so there are small step stools available. The containers are all arranged in rows and clearly marked. There is another adjacent area where bottle and can deposits can be redeemed. The staff are usually over there working with people, but they are responsible for the entire facility. I arrived sometime mid-morning on a weekday because I'd taken the day off work and was just doing house chores. I had a crazy amount of cardboard after having decluttered the garage and thrown a lot of stuff out over the prior few weeks. So I am parked next to a cardboard container and wordlessly pushing in a flattened cardboard. There are a few other pieces on the ground right near me that someone else left. I also put those into the container. I head back over to my vehicle to get another load. An irritated male voice catches my attention. Let him be known as Joe. You're putting it all in wrong. You are making a huge mess. You deaf? Don't they train anyone around here? I'm now looking to see where the voice is coming from. I see him. He's a handyman type in his late 50s or early 60s, in need of a haircut, driving a beat up old pickup with all sorts of random stuff in its bed. Finally got your attention. You too afraid to get your hands hands dirty and do real work? What are you talking about? Look! Look! He points around at various items on the ground. Look! He points to a piece of cardboard sticking out from a different container than the one I'm using. Why are you even talking to me about this? None of that is my job. I go back to what I was doing and ignore him. Joe mutters something I can't quite hear and shuffles away. A few minutes pass by and I'm done. I close the back of my vehicle and lo and behold, he's back with someone in tow. The other person is wearing a fluorescent safety shirt with the name of the facility printed on it. This employee, Keone, looks to be in his early 20s and has no idea what's going on. There he is! The guy who won't do his job! Who? Him? Points at me questioningly. Wow, is everyone retarded here? How hard is it to get you guys to get off your fat butts and do some real work? He grabs cardboard from the ground and tries and fails to get it all the way into the container. Tries again and fails and is now very physically agitated. I am not the skinnier guy that I used to be, but I'm not that fat yet. Keone is, however, very heavy, but in a more dangerous local boy kind of way. He's also not reacting very well to the insults. Hey, hey, slow down. First of all, I don't work here. Yes, you do. You helped unload that car. He points at my car. That's my car, you idiot. Keone looking at Joe emotionlessly. Tell me again what you said. Me also looking at Joe. Get in your truck now. Leave. Don't come back. You're about to get the crap kicked out of you. Joe seemed to realize the truth of where this was going with the employee. He left spinning his tires a bit on the gravel. Keone and I laughed afterwards. I'm sure you hate just as much as me having to deal with those know-it-all types, especially when it comes to handyman work, because I'll admit I'm not
not the most handy person. I'll try and learn this or that when I can, but intuitively I don't know a lot of that stuff. So then comes along the know-it-all handyman that always has to criticize what you're doing and it's so uncomfortable when you're doing nothing wrong or you're actually doing it the right way and they're doing it wrong, but because they position themselves as the one who knows what they're doing, you dare not question them. Usually for those types of people, that's the one area in their life that they've actually mastered and so their identity is so tied to it. It's also the one way they can feel superior against those who aren't handy like they are. So flashback to my first year of teaching. I was a 21 year old middle school teacher, fresh out of college and extremely green. I was admittedly shaky when it came to parent communication. It is quite intimidating to speak to a parent as an equal when you are less than 10 years older than their children. Many of them were old enough to be my parents, which made things awkward for me. Enter mum, her daughter, Diva, did absolutely nothing in my class except stir up drama, be extremely rude and obnoxious, and generally anything but do her work. Now, student grades are easily accessible at all times through an online parent portal, so I have always been in the opinion that parents should never be surprised by grades at the end of the quarter. So the end of the second quarter is drawing to an end, and I get an abrasive email from a mum demanding a parent-teacher conference with an administrator present. Of course, teachers are instructed to meet with the parent anytime they want a conference. One of my assistant principals sat in on the meeting. From the the moment mum sat across from me, I knew where Diva got her attitude. Mum was belligerent, accusing and rude. She began to angrily accuse me of causing her daughter to fail. Somehow my fault? Basically, I should have done everything under the sun to make sure she didn't fail. I should have contacted her early. I should have sent her home extra copies. I should have been checking Diva's agenda, etc. While I admittedly should have called her early, her chewing me out in front of my boss was the most embarrassing moment of my career. My assistant principal worked out a compromise that went like this. Since mum didn't want a lot of phone calls, apparently a busy person, it was agreed that I would write a note to mum in Diva's agenda every Friday about her grade and her missing work. Embarrassed and chastised, I could barely look my boss in the eye. I resolved that I would comply to the fullest, so much so that it would be annoying. I would be above reproach, so that she could never berate me like that again. However, I could never have imagined the incredible events that followed. In the weeks that followed, I not only wrote in Diva's agenda, but I printed off lists of her missing assignments, progress reports and letters home, and stapled them to her agenda. I did this every week without fail, and Diva's behaviour did not change. By the end of the third quarter, she was missing 8 assignments and was failing my class, yet again. Lo and behold, I get an email from mum demanding a parent-teacher conference with a principal present. She arrives and starts in on me again about how I'm unprofessional and how I'm not supporting her daughter and how I had yet again failed to notify her that her daughter was failing. Then the realization struck me. She had never looked at the agenda. I painstakingly stapled progress reports, letters and missing work into her agenda for nearly three months and she never once checked. A grin broke across my face. Can we look at Diva's agenda? There's something I think you should see. Mum leaves the room and comes back with Diva's agenda. I begin flipping through the agenda, showing her every single page that I wrote on or stapled. Now, if you'll notice, I have written in Diva's agenda and stapled progress reports, letters to you, and lists of missing work into her agenda every single week since we last spoke, as per our agreement. Are you telling me that you didn't check her agenda once? Blood drains from the mum's face as she realizes her credibility with my principal is now gone. At this point in the quarter, it is too late for your child to turn in makeup work. Please be sure to be checking your child's agenda every Friday for an update concerning her progress. In order for your child to be successful, you need to be involved. Do you have any questions? The mum was stammering with excuses and apologizing for not checking. At this point, I could tell that my principal was stifling laughter, so I knew that I had won. Mum left very quickly, and I never received one of those harsh emails again. Diva's behavior didn't improve at all, but I rode the satisfaction of that W all the way through to summer. When a child is failing at school, sometimes it can be tricky to know who's at fault. It's not like there aren't bad teachers. I think we've all experienced having a bad teacher in our lives, but at the same time it's the responsibility of the student and the parent to make sure that the child is doing the work that is required of them, to actually put in an effort to strive to improve and achieve success. I would tend to say that it's usually more the child 
child or the parent's fault, because even in a class with a bad teacher, a student that is self-motivated can still succeed. But what do you think? Do you think it's usually the teacher's fault, the child's fault, or the parent's, or some sort of combination? Let me know in the comments below. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.